topic for today's lecture will be the Hartree and Hartree for approximations, methods for calculating of electronic structure of metals. If you think about what we have done up to now is that we discussed the interactions on the quantum mechanical level, but just the interactions between electrons and ions. Other than that, our electrons were free. This was the point of the nearly free electron model where we then said, okay, let us add some interactions for the electrons and those were the interactions between electrons and ions. What we are still missing are the interactions between electrons. And that is what we will try to include today. So the way how we will proceed is that we will combine a classical electrostatics within the uh, Coulombic formulations. We have the Coulombic forces in which the uh, interaction between charged particles is proportional to the charge of individual particles and uh, inversely proportional to the squared distance. There is obviously an attractive kind of interaction if the two charges are opposite or a repulsive interaction for the charges of the same type. And we will combine it now with the quantum mechanical principles and then get the whole plethora of different interactions from ionic covalent van der Waals bonding or going towards also magnetic systems, uh, including paramagnetic, ferromagnetic, non-magnetic uh, spin arrangement. So we will really uh, now be able to describe even the electron-electron interactions. In fact, this combination of classical physics here at the level of Coulombic forces and the quantum mechanics, this is something similar to what we've done in the Sommerfeld model, in which we combined the classical thermodynamics and uh, statistical physics with the quantum mechanical physics, in which we uh, replace the Maxwell Boltzmann statistics with Fermi Dirac statistics. So it is to this extent a similar approach. <clears throat> and uh, we start right away with simplifying our life. We will introduce so called von Oppenheimer approximation or um, the adiabatic approximation. And here we are saying that the electrons are much lighter than nuclei. And that means that the nuclei are uh, basically static from the point of view of fast changes of electronic uh, system of the electronic cloud. In other words, the electrons can instantaneously follow the nucleus. Wherever nucleus moves, its electronic cloud simply follows. It's not the other way around. If there is a small perturbation to an electronic cloud, the very heavy nuclei take their time, take certain uh, relaxation time before they react to this perturbation of the electronic cloud. This born oppenheimer approximation allows us to separate the coordinates and the motion of electrons and nuclei. And we will then separate our total many body wave function, which in principle describes all particles we have in the system. We'll split it into two contributions, the electronic and the nuclear part. Once again, we will from now on working only with the electronic part, and we will solve the instantaneous solution of the electronic cloud in a configuration, a static configuration of alpha ions. So you can imagine this this way that you essentially make a snapshot of your moving crystal. And at that very configuration, when you take the snapshot, you configure the distribution of electrons, the charges. And a few moments later, you take another snapshot, you have slightly different configuration of nuclei, and you again calculate the corresponding charges. And if you now do this for this uh, static configurations, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation tells you that the resulting charge density, the distribution of charges, is representative also 
for the real dynamical system in which the nuclei are moving. Nuclei move, but the electrons, they instantaneously follow them. And again, this whole idea of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation is actually uh, based on the fact that the uh, nuclei, which are composed of protons and, uh, and neutrons are several orders of magnitude heavier than each an individual electron. Uh, if we would then look at the corresponding De Broglie wavelength, we would see that while electrons follow the quantum mechanical description or, or, or uh, in need of the quantum mechanical description, the nuclei can be described using classical uh, mechanics. So let's start with combining really or, or writing down the energetic contributions of our whole system. And we will start with the simplest possible or almost the simplest possible molecule. We start with the hydrogen two molecule. The simplest possible would be actually the molecule that contains two protons and one electron would be the H2 plus molecule. But let us start with something more realistic and the H2 molecule. The molecule contains two, sorry, it contains two protons, two nuclei. Uh, each of these nucleus contains one proton and uh, actually one, one neutron, but this adds only the mass. So uh, for, in terms of charges, we have there one proton and each of the hydrogen atom brings in the game one electron. Protons are positively charged, electrons negatively charged with the same charge. And we will use the small letters to label the positions of electrons and the capital letters to label the positions of protons. We need to write down the total energy of the system in order to be able to write down the Hamiltonian. So let's start with this. The total energy of the system is composed of two contributions, kinetic energy and potential energy. Again, the kinetic energy can be split into two contributions. One is the kinetic energy of electrons and one is the kinetic energy of nuclei. So far, we are doing nothing else than just writing down the classical physics energy contributions. We now write down the total uh, and the kinetic energy of the electronic cloud, which corresponds to the contributions, kinetic energies of individual electrons. Uh, the momenta P1 and P2 correspond to electron one and electron two. Each electron has a mass and E. The same thing we can do for the nuclei. We note here that the mass of the whole nucleus is labeled here as Mn. We want to work within the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. That means that certain parts of the energy are going to be can neglect it in uh, specifically, we will neglect the total energy contribution of the nuclei and the kinet, right? And that's uh, the, this, this uh, lower part that we have on, on the slide. So this part will not contribute to our total kinetic energy. How about the potential energy? Well, the only potential energy or the interactions that we will contribute or con consider here are the electrostatic interactions. So interactions between charged particles. We have there obviously an interaction between nucleus and nucleus, which is, you recognize from here, the very well known formula uh, corresponding to the Coulombic interaction of two particles, one at position R1, one at position R2, and having the same charge, both of them of E. It can be plus E or minus E. Now we know that these are the uh, actually uh, protons. That means both of them have the charge plus E. With the second part is the identical contribution, now the interaction between electrons. 
right? So again, the same charges at the distance uh, which correspond to the end vectors R1, R2. And finally, we have the last contribution, probably the most interesting one, um, in which we have interaction between nuclei and electrons. And so for each of these contributions, we write down the electrostatic contribution or interaction between an electron, for example, in this case, R1, so it's this electron, and the corresponding proton, so the or nucleus at uh, the position R1, capital R1 here. So this is the first contribution, the interaction between those two guys. Then we have, for example, the interaction between the same nucleus, but the other electron. So the same nucleus and the other electron, and we get the electrostatic interaction shown in blue here. And so we sum up over all pairs, uh, ranging over all electrons and all nuclei, coming up with the final formula shown here. This formula is now a slightly more general than our H2 molecule, because you might have noticed here the atomic number. So we are now allowing each nucleus to have a different number of electrons, sorry, different number of protons, so to have a different charge. In the case of H2 molecule, the Zi for both protons is equal to one. We also notice here the opposite sign corresponding to the fact that we have now interaction between the positively and negatively charged particles. And once again, we apply the Born-Oppenheimer approximation in which we say, well, the nuclei are at rest. That means their nucleus, nucleus interaction, the first part contribution, or the first term in the potential energy uh, expansion is not equal to zero, but is a constant. And since we can set our uh, zero energy level arbitrarily, we just set it so that it's equal to uh, this nucleus-nucleus uh, no, no interaction, and we simply uh, leave this term out of the, uh, of, of the equations, right? So forgetting about this term uh, is equivalent to applying the Born-Oppenheimer adiabatic approximation. So our total Hamiltonian now uh, represents the total energy of the system. We have already simplified in such a way that we have only the kinetic energy of the electrons, and our potential energy contains only the interactions between electrons and nuclei and between electrons themselves. That means if you think about the kinetic energy of uh, electrons, Te, this was the sum over all electrons, Pi squared over 2Me. What about the, uh, the total kinetic, uh, sorry, the total potential energy? Total potential energy is the interaction between nuclei and electrons plus the electron-electron interaction. And this interaction between nuclei and electrons can be written as a sum over all electrons. Then for each electron, we actually sum the interactions with all nuclei. So we go then one over four uh, pi epsilon zero. And then let's write it here, set j squared over, and then we have rj minus r e i. And it should be minus because we have charges which have opposite signs, plus v e e. Looking at the expression for the total kinetic energy, and the electron nucleus part, we realize that both of them are containing sum over all electrons. And so we can put together all terms which belong to an electron I, uh, because those do not contain any interactions with any other electrons. If you look at this term for Pi, we have here clearly just the kinetic energy of an electron I. And here we have just 
potential energy, electrostatic potential energy of interacting our eyes electron with all other nuclei. Putting these two terms together, we obtain the single electron uh, Hamiltonian. So we obtain the Hamiltonian HI, which is Pi over 2mp, Pi squared, minus 1 over 4 Pi epsilon 0, sum over all nuclei, and then we would have the uh, atomic number of nucleus, J's nucleus, E squared over Rj minus Re. This is now the Hamiltonian that we have here in the first part of the sum. We would sum over all of these Hamiltonians to get actually the total electronic Hamiltonian. What we are missing still in order to come to the uh, born oppenheim approximation is the electron-electron interaction. And this will be the real troublemaker, as we will see, because we cannot write this easily in the form of isolated electronic Hamiltonians. This is the, uh, the quantum mechanical uh, troublemaker. So when we put here, okay. So here we have the rest of uh, what we have just shown. And in the case of H2 molecule, this electron-electron interaction is a simple single term. Still the troublemaker, the guy who makes it difficult for any analytical solution. We'll then end up with a two electron Schrodinger equation as shown here, in which the Hamiltonian is given exactly by this formula. And we notice that we have exchanged here in order to make it an operator. So we should have heads everywhere here, right? So um, in order to make it an operator, we have now exchanged the momentum operator with a Laplace operator here. So that is the second derivative with respect to position. We can also write this in a simple form in this uh, second, second quantization uh, as shown down here. If we now want to make it a bit more general, we go beyond the simple hydrogen two molecule, the story remains the same, only the formalism becomes a little bit more difficult. So when capital N now signifies the number of electrons in our system, we again write the total Hamiltonian as a sum over this isolated electronic Hamiltonians plus all the electron-electron interaction. The isolated electron Hamiltonians are identical to what we had before with a typo here, please correct it. There shouldn't be an E here, but maybe we can label it as M, for example, where capital M uh, is the number of ions or nuclei. So N is the number of electrons and M is the number of nuclei. So this is the sum over interactions of our chosen electron I with all other nuclei. And the only or the major complication in this case is now the electron-electron uh, interaction which as you can see from the expression here, becomes now a bit more involved and essentially spans over all pairs of electrons. Note the boundaries that we have on these sums, which uh, prevent from double counting the interaction. So each pair of electrons is there really just once. Using this Hamiltonian, we again come to the same kind of a many body uh, electron Schrodinger equation in which our wave function, which is essentially the electronic wave function, is now a function of n electron positions. The Hamiltonian is now uh, also containing a term which. Uh, contains the interactions between electron and electron. Uh, 
speaking about it in uh, or putting it in a perspective of what we had done up to now, we were speaking about free electrons. The free electrons would have Hamiltonian in which this part was not contained and also this part was not contained. So our Hamiltonian was a simple sum over single electronic Hamiltonians and each of these Hamiltonians contained only the kinetic energy. There was no potential energy because the electrons were uh, free. If we then edit the nearly free electrons or uh, the tight binding method, we edit and eventually we edit it in a slightly more complicated way than this uh, point Coulombic charges, but we edit the interaction between electrons and a nuclei. The interaction was still allowing for writing the Hamiltonian fully as a sum of single electronic Hamiltonians. There was still no electron-electron interaction. And now for the first time, we are trying to add this interaction into the game. How to solve such example or such, such expression? We can apply variational principle in which we, if we rewrite the Schrodinger equation that we have here, we can rewrite it in such a way that we calculate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian operator minus the eigenvalue E, and we will try to minimize this. Well, of course, if we write it now, uh, let me write it in this uh, second quantization in which it is slightly easier, right? So this is the Schrodinger equation in the second quantization. And what we do is that we multiply it by the complex conjugate function, so by the bra vector. And so when we end up here, uh, sorry, let me write it here, of course, with the star, this would be when we write it explicitly in the integrals. So then we have the Hamiltonian here, psi equals psi e psi. Now you realize that e as an energy is just a number. So what we are doing here is actually finding the e Hamiltonian psi is equal to e psi psi. Now this function psi must be normalized. That means this all stuff is equal to one and we get here E. So we are finding, or we are looking for a function Psi, which really results in the solution in the solution in such a way that the expectation value of Hamiltonian acting on this function Psi is equal to energy E or total energy. This variational principle is a very general concept that might be applied, but it's not very practical. If I uh, tell you to search for the minimum position in uh, Austria on the landscape, uh, you will be able to do that. Maybe you will follow the rivers and so on. And finally, you will find where is the lowest point of Austria. Uh, but Unless I tell you that you should do it this way, that you follow the rivers, you will be probably just randomly measuring the altitude at different places uh, at the area of Austria. And you might find a solution, you might find something which is close to the solution, but you will never be sure if there is not any, uh, any lower place. So it would be better to actually find a different type of uh, approximation or different type of, uh, uh, of approach, which provides us with a direct recipe, how to find the wave function instead of doing the variational principle. And this uh, direct method will be based on so-called product ansatz. Product ansatz, which is also uh, a term used in English, we, um, uh, this means that we will assume, and at this point, it's really just an assumption, that we can write the many body wave function, psi, 
as a product of single particle wave functions. With this assumption, we will be able to rewrite the Schrodinger equation into one electron equation again, which is much easier to solve. Just to remind you, what is a Schrodinger equation? Schrodinger equation is in principle a partial differential equation, right? If we think about one electron, we have there the kinetic energy, which is written as one over one half. And then we have the uh, derivative with respect to position, second derivative, plus maybe some potential acting on a function for one electron. So indeed we have the partial differential equation. You might remember from calculus that a uh, function like that can be solved, but it's not always very easy. What we have now here is such a partial differential equation in three dimensions. So the function we are looking for, function psi, is a function of three variables, x, y, and z. Hmm, that is already much more complicated mathematically, right? If you just imagine that now your Hamiltonian contains a term which is one over two me, and then we have the second derivative with respect to x plus second derivative with respect to y and second derivative with respect to z, things get complicated. Yet, this still might be doable. Now imagine that we do not even have one electron, that we have two electrons. Then we have here a derivative with respect to the x, y, and z for the first electron. Plus, there would be the partial derivatives with respect to the second electron, and so on. And the function we are looking for for two electrons will be actually a function of six variables, x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2. That's already fairly complicated object. And I believe that you have never tried to solve anything like that in, in uh, calculus. Now imagine you have a simple aluminum atom. Simple aluminum atom has 13 electrons. And so your function that you're looking for is in principle a function of 39 variables. And you speak about one atom in perfect FCC lattice. So you see how involved this becomes mathematically. And so any assumption we can do will help us to manage this problem. Whether this assumption is valid or not, whether we can really do it, let's postpone this discussion for later on. For the time being, let us assume that indeed the functions, the solutions of the electrons will be so nicely behaved that we can do this. And that you can't do this always, it's very easy to see from, for example, taking into account such a simple function as x plus y. Right? You might not be able to, uh, to write it simply as a function f of x times a function of y. Good. Anyway, let's assume we can apply the product ansatz and we go on. What does this is that our many body or many electron Schrodinger equation simplifies into one electron Schrodinger equation. What we have now here is a Hamiltonian acting on a wave function, which describes one electron only. You see that it's a variable. We have there a position of one single particle. How does this Hamiltonian H0 look like? Hamiltonian H0 contains the kinetic energy of this electron. This is something that we expect, of course. It, it contains the interactions with all nuclei, be those expressed in the simple electrostatic terms, what we did on the previous slides, or be this really the 
continuous periodic potential as we discussed it, uh, for example, in the nearly free electron model, right? So this is the interaction or the potential that one single electron feels from the crystal, from the nuclei. And then we have a new term. We will call this a Hartree potential. What is this Hartree potential? Hartree potential is written in simple terms here. And this is essentially our electron-electron interaction, if you think about it, all right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is the electrostatic, of course. Um, so here we have the Hartree potential, Hartree potential, which corresponds to the electron-electron interaction. Now, what I would like you uh, to be able to do during the exam is not necessarily write this down. But if you look at it, you should be able to understand it. How can you understand it? Well, you look at this prefactor and you say, hmm, that reminds me probably of some uh, terms I've seen in Coulombic interaction. So it might be some electrostatic interaction. Look here and you say, aha, uh -huh, we have all particles with the same charge and all being charged uh, with one E. So probably those would be the electronic interactions, okay? Finally, we look at this last part here. What is that? Well, the upper part, it gives you a probability of an electron nu being at position R. Sorry, R prime, okay? So this is exactly how we were taught to, in, uh, to um, interpret the wave function times its complex conjugate. That the wave function times its complex conjugate at the same place gives you the probability of the particle, which is described by this wave function, being present at that point R prime. What we do with this integral, we essentially calculate the uh, term one over r minus r prime, the length of this vector, which is the interaction distance over which the two electrons potentially interact. And we weight it by a probability of an electron nu being at position r prime. With this integral, we simply sum up over all of these interactions. So we have an, a test electron, and then we calculate the interactions between this electron and electron nu being at all other positions. And the interactions at all other positions are weighted by the probability of the electron nu being at the position R prime. And then we simply sum up these pair interactions. You see that this is this last part here, the sum over all interactions. We, uh, okay, so now we are using again a different terminology. Small n is the number of electrons, whereas capital N is the number of nuclei, right? So um, this is to a test on your, uh, how, how carefully you're listening and that uh, I managed to confuse you within two slides or not. So now we sum up over all remaining electrons, but our electron lambda. So that's the electron that we are trying to solve the solution. Good. And we do this. And um, you are all set, right? You have a Hamiltonian, well-defined Hamiltonian. The Hartree potential is just an addition to the nuclei potential, so this is not a big deal. And we are back to where we were in principle with the free electrons or, or tight binding model in which we were solving the one electron Schrodinger equation. Where is the catch? Well, the catch is of course the Hartree potential. Look at this. In order to find a solution for our one electron that we are interested in, we need to know all other solutions. And how do we find all the other solutions? Well, we find them using the same method for which we would actually do need to know also the solution of the 
uh, of our electron lambda. So we are somehow running in circles. We now found a way how to calculate the solutions provided that we know them already. This looks like uh, a typical hen and egg problem, which however here has a, a mathematical way, method how to solve this. And these are so-called self-consistent solutions. You can iterate these solutions, and I do not go into detail here under which conditions does this work, but in our case, in most of the cases, it actually works. And it will work in the following way. You start with a certain guess of single particle states. What can be those? Well, that might be, for example, the solutions of your electrons without any electron-electron interaction. So that might be, for example, the tight binding solutions or nearly free electron solutions. You start with those and you construct the corresponding hard tree potential. That you can do because now you have a set of solutions. With this hard tree potential and the nucleus potential and the kinetic energy operator, for one electron, you can solve the single particle Hartree equation. And that will give you a set of new states. And then you compare those with the old ones. Are they the same? Are they close to this, the old ones? Or are they completely different? You, of course, have to set a certain convergence criterion to say whether you are happy with the new solutions or not. This uh, might be somehow a metric on the functions themselves, therefore describing really how much do the individual wave functions change. It might be also in terms of the total energy. So for example, what is then the sum of these single particle energies that you get from the individual hard tree? Uh, was long, right? From the hard tree equations, so you will say, okay, some, the, uh, some of my single particle energies is my total energy, and I will monitor how much does this change from one step to the other step. If you are unhappy with how your new set of wave functions performs, that means they still change a lot, you use them as input to calculate the hard tree potential, and again, you repeat the whole cycle and you get an another set of single particle solutions. And again, you say, okay, I'm, am I happy with them or do I need to uh, iterate more? And this iterative solution, this is so-called self-consistent um, method, which in majority of cases with reasonably chosen uh, starting single particle wave functions will yield a converged result. You might be unlucky and your initial solution or even the setting of your problem might actually lead to a diverging solution and this uh, self-consistent approach would not work. But in majority of cases, it does work. Yoo-hoo, so we are very happy because we have all of a sudden a way how to solve our many electron problem, uh, which can include in addition to the electron nucleus interaction, also the electron-electron interactions. Well, then we remember a famous scientist, Wolfgang Pauli, another famous Austrian-born physicist. And uh, we know him mostly through the Pauli exclusion principle, which is typically formulated in terms that no two fermions can occupy the same state. And I think this is what we are all taught already at the high school when we start thinking about the electronic uh, structure of atoms. Well, it can be also formulated in an identical way, and that is that the fermionic wave function must be antisymmetric. Antisymmetric with respect to exchange of any two particles. 
So if I exchange positions of any two electrons out of my n electrons in the system, the sign of the wave function changes. Now, what does this mean? Again, this is something where I believe our intuitive insight completely fails because we can hardly ever imagine what a wave function itself on its own mean. What we can imagine is the wave function star times wave function, which represents the probability. But obviously now, if you calculate the probability of the situation with two atoms having exchanged their positions, the probability is identical to the original one where they had the original positions. And that's how it should be, right? Electrons as fermions are identical particles that we cannot distinguish. That means if I exchange them, so I have a system, I go outside of my room, some one of you exchanges two, uh, two electrons and I come back, I will not realize any change to my system because all what I see is their distribution, the probability where an electron sits. So this antisymmetric behavior of the total wave function is purely quantum mechanical effect. In fact, this does not apply to classical particles uh, within the Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics. It applies only to fermions, to the to, um, uh, to the half spin particles. Let's have a look what this uh, Pauli exclusion principle does to our uh, total wave function, which we just built as a product of single particle wave functions. And we will start again with the example of two electrons. <clears throat> and let us assume that that we take all right uh, let's let's assume we start with something different right let's assume that we start indeed with our uh, product ansatz so this is now our many uh, particle wave function what happens when we exchange the two uh, particles, psi, R1, so I calculate R1, R2, R1. What will happen? Well, I follow exactly the recipe I have up here. So I will end up with uh, phi A, which is my one function on argument R2, phi B on argument R1. Hmm. What was my original function? Psi R1, R2 was phi A, R1, phi B on R2. Pauli says that these two things should be identical up to a sign. But obviously, this is not minus this function. So we need to build actually a more complicated functional form of our wave function than just a simple product of single particle wave functions. And uh, let us get inspired by the uh, tight binding method, the linear combination of uh, atomic orbitals in which we were using such a function, such a combination of orbitals uh, for the uh, total electronic wave function. Let's do the same thing here. What happens when we take such a, a wave function and we try to put two electrons in the same system? That means that essentially A and B are identical. Right? So I put one electron and the second electron in the same system. That means both their states are described by the function psi, uh, sorry, phi A. Well, constructing such a many body wave function gives me this formula. 
phi a on r1, phi a on r2, minus phi a on r2, phi a on r1, which is equal to zero. So eventually taking such a construct immediately fulfills the Pauli exclusion principle in the sense that if I try to put two electrons, two fermions in the same state, corresponding or the resulting wave function will be identically equal to zero corresponding to a state that cannot exist. On the other hand, if I put the two electrons in two different states, then if I exchange their positions, so uh, the position, the electron two will be in, in, in state uh, phi A and the position the electron one will be in the state phi B, I get a wave function, which is phi A R2, phi B R1 minus phi uh, A R1, phi B R2, which we see from the definition is exactly the minus phi psi R1, R2. So we get exactly here the fulfillment of the Pauli exclusion principle. Good. So it seems that we can work with functions that will look like product ansatz. We just need to make them a little bit more complicated. So we still can work with functions composed of single particle wave functions. We just need to arrange them in a more clever way than just a simple product of those functions. But before we actually look at the final form, we can also raise a question, what about the electronic spins, right? So the whole point of having electrons is that those are half spin particles. And uh, how do the spins complicate the whole story? Of course, the wave function must be anti-symmetric as well. And uh, what we do then is that we uh, complement our spatially resolved single particle wave functions with so-called spinors. So the functions that re uh, result in plus or minus one effectively corresponding to the uh, spin of a, of a particle. Now, let us try to use such a complicated function and again investigate what happens when we put two electrons in the same state. Well, when we put them in the same state, now doesn't mean that they have only the same uh, radial distribution function or the, uh, the, the state A or B, but they also have the same spin. That means that both of those electrons one and two are in the same spin state. We here we use the example for uh, that they are in the spin up configuration. And once again, if we then write down how does such a total wave function look like, we end up with a function that is identically equal to zero, corresponding to the fact that according to Pauli exclusion principle no two electrons can occupy the same state. And now we really acknowledge the fact that the state is not simply labeling these states up to, uh, as we did it up to now, one, two, three, but that each state, each index uh, indexing the, the state, be it a K vector or, or whatever, can actually correspond to two electrons with two opposite spins. What happens now when we put the two electrons in the same state A, but with opposite spins? Well, happens what you would expect, right? Things work. So indeed, our many electron wave function uh, yields the anti-symmetric behavior. You can write this uh, explicitly out if you want to. Now the functions star, uh, phi A are identical for both uh, spins but the spinner one and two have opposite spins. Good. We are not going to complicate our life again with the spins. We just know that the whole 
methodology and the whole formalism we are introducing here works with spins as well. The question now is, how do we construct our wave function such that it fulfills the Pauli exclusion principle and still is a formed or is, is a consists of the single electron wave functions? I'm not sure if any one of you can see it in this expression that we have here for two electrons, but eventually this looks like a determinant. What if I just write this instead of A and B, if I write also indexes one and two, and I write instead of phi A R one, I write an element one one times element two two minus element one two times element two one. Right, so the first index corresponds to whether it's A or B, the second index is essentially the index uh, labeling the electrons. And in such an equation, I'm pretty sure that all of you, especially after I said it, will see that this is a determinant of a matrix A11, A12, A21, and A22. So this provides us with a whole that I can write this many electron wave function as a determinant of a very special matrix in which I put here phi R1, phi AR2, phi BR1, and phi BR2. So what I'm doing is that in columns, uh, sorry, in rows, I put the individual solutions, the possible states, A, B, C, whatever. And in the columns, I put the individual electrons. So let's have a look how does this look like when we have indeed more than two electrons. We end up with so-called Slater determinant. The Slater determinant looks exactly what I have just said. Uh, there is, in addition to that, the normalization prefactor, square root of uh, n factorial, where n is the number of electrons. You might also now remember some of the rules from linear algebra. What happens when you calculate a determinant of a matrix with two exchanged rows or two exchanged columns? Does anyone remember what would that do? So if I have a matrix one, two, three, two, three, that's not three, two, four, six, and one, five, seven, for example, right? And I want to calculate the determinant of this. And then next day I come and I want to calculate the determinant of two, four, six, one, two, three, one, five, seven. Do you know what is the relationship between those two determinants? Anyone? Hello, wake up. Anyone there? I see plenty of you attending, so no one dares to say, okay, I have to speak with the linear algebra teachers. So these two determinants will be identical in absolute values, but will have an opposite sign. If I take a matrix and exchange two rows or two columns, the determinant of the matrix changes its sign. Right. This is actually uh, one of the basic rules that you find out in calculating determinants. Another question, what happens if I have actually two linear dependent rows? What is the determinant of such a matrix? Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's exactly the case that we have here, right? So we see that the second row is twice the first row. So the determinant, okay, so we, here we know that these are uh, opposite, that we can write it as two times of a determinant of a matrix one, two, three, one, two, three, one, five, seven. And we have here twice an identical row. Well, we know that this will be minus two times the determinant of a matrix in which we exchange those two rows. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, five, seven. You haven't noticed that I exchanged them, but indeed I did, right? I wrote the first one as the second one and the second one as the first one. So that's why I wrote the minus one here. So what must be the determinant in order to fulfill this? Must be equal to zero. What does that mean? It means that if you now put two electrons in the same state, the determinant, and therefore this many body wave function given by this later determinant form will be identically equal to zero. So Pauli is happy. It also means that the moment you exchange two electrons, they will change. So the wave function will immediately change its sign. So it is anti-symmetric. And again, Pauli is calling hooray, everything works. So things seem to be now settled in the sense that we still can search for single electron wave functions. That's good. We know the form of these single electron wave functions. It is a bit more complicated than just a simple product ansatz, but we know the form that will fulfill also the Pauli exclusion principle. And with those, we know how to also include the Hartree potential, how to include the nucleus potential, which is trivial, and also then we have the individual uh, kinetic energies. Well, nothing comes for free. And the price we have to pay here is that actually in this single electron heart equation, a new interaction will occur. It's so-called non-local Fock operator, operator because it acts on the solution that we are looking for. It can be, of course, included in the Hamiltonian, so the final Schrodinger equation is H0 plus this uh, non-local potential times the wave function. Oh, actually, I can't write it this way. I take it back, right? Uh, that's that's the point that I'm, I'm saying here that... Da -da -da. Yes. No, of course I can, I can write it this way. So I'm taking it back again. Uh, I have the Hamiltonian. Where can I write it? Hamiltonian H0 plus the non-local potential acting on the solution that I'm looking for mu equals the one particle energy mu. Now this non-local potential, the name comes from a certain uh, from a certain property. If you look once more at the analytical formula, which I will never ask you to write down explicitly, it should remind you actually of the Hartree potential. The Hartree potential in the sense that we have here again the uh, electrostatic interaction. Of course, I'm very bad with typos, so we are missing here also the charge should be E squared here. We have the distance between our electron at position R and the test electron at position R prime. But hang on now, look at this one. I can't interpret the uh, nominator anymore as a probability of an electron, now what? Lam lambda to be at position R prime because here I have a probability of electron lambda being at position R prime, but the other electron being also at this position. 
It's a completely uh, quantum mechanical quantity, which we have no classical uh, analog for. And it actually corresponds to so-called, it's written here, exchange hole. It uh, brings a completely new interaction between the electrons, so-called exchange interaction. The name is obviously coming from our definition or from, from what we did in the Pauli exclusion principle in which we were exchanging the positions of two electrons. Uh, this exchange interaction is absolutely critical for describing um, the fermionic spin interactions and is the origin of magnetism. If we had no exchange interaction, we would have no magnetic ordering at all in the system. In terms of the mathematics, this exchange interaction further complicates the form of the uh, of the Hamiltonian and further complicates the evaluation of these single particle wave functions. Nevertheless, we have here once again a route, a method, how we can, uh, which we can follow. Uh, we will have the one particle Hamiltonian containing the kinetic energy. Uh, interaction with nuclei, interaction, electrostatic interaction between electrons, and a quantum mechanical interaction between fermions. All of those we put in, we solve the single particle wave functions iteratively using the self consistency cycle. And out of those, we now know how to construct the many body wave function with which we can then further work. So this brings me already to the end of today's rather mathematical insight of how to include the electron-electron interactions in our uh, quantum mechanical treatment. We have first started with uh, describing the Hartree method, which um, can be very simply uh, understood in terms of the electrostatic pair interactions between all our charged entities we have in the system. Actually, before that, we have introduced the born oppenheimer approximation in which we said, let's put aside the uh, nuclei and we fix them so we have no nuclei, uh, nuclei kinetic energy and the interactions between nuclei, uh, nucleus, nucleus are sort of just a, a constant contribution so we can exclude them from our Hamiltonia. And then we said, all right, let's try to search for a um, many body wave function in the form of a uh, product of single particle wave functions. We indeed succeeded doing that, but then we put it on scrutiny of Pauli's exclusion principle, which it failed. It brought us on the idea of uh, still sticking with these single particle wave functions, but reformulating it using a uh, bit more involved mathematical uh, form, so-called um, Slater determinant, which now allows both to use the single electron wave functions on one hand, and on the other hand, to fulfill the Pauli exclusion principle. The price that we paid is that this single electronic Hamiltonian became mathematically more complicated, because we have now included a new quantum, purely quantum mechanical interaction, so-called exchange interaction. If you now try to use this Hartree-Fock method for um, any realistic systems, it will turn out that uh, this method is very difficult to be used for crystals, can be used for small molecules. So it is mostly used, let's say, in, uh, in organic chemistry. Uh, it turns out that the final electronic structure coming out of the Hartree-Fock method, of course, being much better than the Hartree method, 
and probably being better than the uh, nearly free electron method is uh, still having troubles with the semiconducting band gaps. We know that free electrons were able to describe only metallic behavior. With nearly free electrons, we finally start with opening the band gap. Now with the Hartree fog, we actually get the band gaps too wide. We overestimate them. And the reason for that is that we are still missing one important interaction. In interaction which is called correlation interaction between electrons. It again has a quantum mechanical origin. It is something which uh, we hardly ever know from our uh, real world, unless uh, you, for example, say, if one of you says, let's go for a beer instead of sitting here at the lecture, everyone follows him. That would be the correlative behavior and something like that also the electrons do. They probably don't go for beer, but they tend to correlate their behavior with each other. And in mathematical terms, this correlation is that we are still sticking to uh, a product of single particle wave functions. So despite all the mathematical developments that we were doing, we still stick with a product of single particle wave functions. Whether or not we can do this, that's a question. If we do this, we are missing the correlations. If the correlation interaction is not important, then the Hartree fog is a good method. If the correlations, so called uh, heavy correlated systems, is important, then the Hartree fog method is a bad approach. And the way out of here to a large degree is uh, going away from the wave function formalism and applying so called uh, density theories, leading us finally to the modern density functional theory, which we will introduce here briefly next.